Let's do this every week. <laughs> you just, oh, you missed the joke? Damn. Ah, oh, it didn't make it in? Laugh again. Should we do it again? Okay. No, 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 no. no. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar, and this is The Beirut Banyan. The last three years cannot be easy for anyone trying to do the right thing, trying to say the right thing, trying to speak the language of both diplomacy and at the end of the day, real politic. There are limits to what you can do, maybe even limits to what you'd like to do, and you don't see them happening. So I'd like to start with the basics. Can you define your role in Lebanon? And I'll say it this way. We have a lot of expectations of what ambassadors should do. We have a lot of maybe imagined expectations as well. And I don't think they're always in your toolkit. Maybe they're not even your job description. But if you had to explain to a local audience what you're here to do, your job at a basic level, what is the German ambassador in Lebanon supposed to do? Okay, I need to, I need to contextualize this. Yeah. Um, and let me go back to the... Uh, um, let me go back to the legal stuff on diplomatic relations. There's a... Um, what's it called? Convention on uh, on diplomatic relations from 1961, and um, I guess we come to that later. There's an Article 41 saying it's the duty not to intervene into internal affairs of a state. Yeah. But before that, in Article 3, it lists all the stuff uh, that are the functions of uh, an embassy and the tasks, if you want, of an ambassador. Uh, which is, it starts with uh, presenting, representing my state, Germany. I'm the representative of not our government, but our president. Mm. Um, uh, protecting the interests of Germany and, its, and the Germans that are here. Uh, negotiating with the government here, um, looking into developments in the country and report back to it, and build up, promote, uh, and support friendly relations with this country. So this is what I'm trying to do, but I have to add a few caveats right from the beginning because um, I, I'm, you know, I'm here for three years now, uh, almost next week, three years. Um, and I'm learning every day. There's mm. not a single day I'm. I have to reconsider what I, what I did before, what I thought before. So it's a constant hermeneutical process where you have to ask yourself, um, uh, what we wrote last week is it still true, or is it, do I have to see it from a different angle? And um, so this is constant work. Um, and of course, part of the work I'm doing uh, is in the embassy. I have a, this is a very large embassy, one of the 10 largest German embassies in the world, oh. Oh. 180 colleagues. Um, so I have to do a lot of administrative stuff. In the end, as an ambassador, you are responsible for, you know, allowing someone to leave Beirut to another place and uh, signing off for his travel stuff or uh, okaying the, you know, the, the sale or the uh, buying some stuff for the embassy, looking into the budget, stuff like this, mm. controlling, monitoring, plenty of work internally, but um, external and, and boring stuff. And uh, externally, there is a, uh, there's a lot of freedom um, because within like 
three weeks after arriving in a country, uh, especially maybe Lebanon, you know more than anyone back home. And they will ask you, they say, uh, so what's happening there? Well, how, can, how can you explain this? And um, so this is what I, what I can do, what I have to do. And then the expectations coming, of course, um, uh, especially maybe from uh, people here that uh, think similar to what I'm thinking or they believe in the same beliefs. Um, I would have to say this is just pure coincidence. Mm. I'm not doing this for you yeah. because I'm not an activist. I'm a civil servant. I have to do my job. I have to be, I have to remain in the limits. I have to, uh, you know, respect the laws and regulations of Lebanon uh, and so on. So I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, not necessarily go on a demonstration or protest with uh, my best friends on the street against uh, a building project in uh, Jemais or whatever. So uh, um, I, I need to respect this. And so that obviously uh, uh, is confronting the expectations of, of, of people who might think the same way I, I do. So I'll ask two questions here. You actually, I did not know it's one of the 10 largest German embassies yeah. in terms of staff. Is, Size, yeah. is that a post-Syria war situation? Yeah. This is because we, we're also dealing with Syria and a large part of my colleagues are local staff. Mm. Uh, among them, a large part dealing with the visa issues and so on and so on. Mm. That's true. It's okay. got to do with uh, Syria. But even then, uh, this is a huge embassy. <laughs> And in terms of diplomacy, which we'll get into later, yeah. is the embassy here also tasked with anything to do with Syria beyond local refugee yeah. administrative issues? Yeah, we cover all of Syria. We mm. cover reporting on Syria. We cover monitoring of uh, whatever uh, you know is being done with our money there, and so on. Yeah, we that's we cover Syria. We are just not going there, and we are not. I'm not ambassador to Syria. Right. Yeah. Because we don't have uh, Any these relations with them. Okay. With the regime. So you also mentioned a word which I thought was important that you can get almost bogged down with things that are more technical maybe or administrative. Yeah. That sounds like red tape or bureaucracy. Has any of that ever prevented you from doing more creative diplomacy the way you'd like to? Um I mean, it's like uh, an organizational issue. I'm just too lame, too uh, lazy, too unorganized to delegate uh, necessarily what I don't want to do. Like, uh, I don't want to sign the uh, permission to drive the car outside of Beirut. Uh, let someone else do it. Um, I'm just too not good enough to, to organize myself in that, in that way. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's overwhelming, the administrative stuff sometimes that's to be done, but um, I'm enjoying a lot of time. I'm, I'm spending uh, a lot of time outside of the office uh, going to places and uh, looking at things because I think you really need to do this. You need to, like, if it is about waste management, for instance, you need to actually go to a place that uh, recycles stuff in order to understand better. You need to go to the... Uh, landfill in Stade uh, to understand better what's what's happening. Yeah. So yeah. So it's a full day from making yeah. from signing paperwork yeah. to seeing field work, if you will. Yeah. I see. I'm enjoying it. You seem to enjoy it, <laughs> and I know I know this from knowing you in person, and also the way you interact online. Mm. There is a positivity to your messaging that reminds me of Tom Fletcher a previous British ambassador. Maybe you know him in a personal... Not personal name, no. But that kind of being social media savvy, mm. but never being cynical. There's no sarcasm, I think, in what you write either. Thank you. But I think maybe it takes a certain personality to pull it off. Before I came here, I was a director for strategic communication in Berlin at I the see. ministry. So we introduced uh, stuff like Twitter accounts for individual diplomats at headquarters mm. uh, you know the the director general for Africa for instance he should have a t Twitter account to report on his issues 
and uh, we introduced this uh, at the time. We did podcasts and stuff like this. So yes, there was a there was an idea that uh, this needs to be done also here in Lebanon. Well, you've done yep. it. Un unlike many other ambassadors that prefer not to be online that much, I think you've found a way to do both at once. And I have a fantastic team dealing with social media. Uh, like we have also doing some, uh, yeah. No, but I'm thinking more... Propaganda. We have Instagram, we have Facebook. Um, please join. But uh, I mean, sorry to make it more personal. I'm not thinking so much the Instagram account. It's more your Twitter mm. feed, which I think is you. I, yeah. I don't think it's someone else writing those tweets. It's, uh, we started like uh, three weeks ago. We were discussing, uh, because sometimes it takes me too long. I do something during the day and then, uh, you know, I don't care for the photos and it takes days until I think about a tweet. Uh, so my colleague comes up to me and says, uh, you're not good enough in this. Uh, let's join you in the team and let's let's do this. Okay. So three weeks ago, we started, uh, I think maybe one or two tweets have been done now. Uh, I, I love that that's diversifying the job. Two tweets. <laughs> so far. So far. <laughs> No, I like the way you handle Twitter. I think it is the right way as an ambassador to express what they're going through without mm. ever sounding cynical. You don't one bit. And I, I appreciate that. In terms of engaging local actors and the way an ambassador communicates to their capital, can you walk me through the basics? Meaning, I know you meet some of the most interesting characters ever born to this planet. <laughs> and you meet them sometimes on a daily basis. And I think you do meet also a lot of strange characters on the way that like to talk to you more than you like to talk to them. And you're pulling in a lot of ideas and opinions. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, like you said earlier, you may have a set belief in one thing that may resonate with the population, but it doesn't register with any of the politicians you're speaking with. When you try to package something to Berlin, and I'm, I'm guessing that's the core responsibility is communicating yeah. yeah walk me through how it's done and how you actually choose the messaging okay i have uh, i have meetings that are obligatory like uh, berlin wants me to present a project to a ministry or discuss with them a project or invite one of the ministers to a international conference mm. in berlin I, I do that but usually i don't um you know, during the three years I've been here, we had 30 months, I think, of caretaker government and yep. six months of proper government. Um, government works with government, but it's more complicated or more difficult if it's just a caretaker government, because I cannot expect a caretaker government to have the same sense of responsibility or sense of sustainability as a proper government mm. in general. So I, I tone down meetings I have with the ministers. I don't, some of the ministers I don't meet. Because they're caretaker or for because other Because I don't, uh, I mean, for instance, his polar meet ministers I don't meet. But that's more German policy than your own, I mean, it's you're, all, you're, yeah, you're not allowed to. In, in I'm a, not allowed to and I have no, I don't see any reason to do it. Yeah. And uh, then there are ministers I don't uh, see because we don't have a lot of dealings with some of the ministries. Mm. Um, I don't uh, usually see uh, party politicians. I have uh, done courtesy visits when I arrived three mm. years ago to, I think, all of them. And uh, for most of them, that was it. I, I go along with the visitors when they come from Germany and they want to see, say, Walid Jumblat. I, I go along. But usually, I don't. Uh, I don't meet uh, party politicians. We've we've done a um, a campaign to meet as many members of uh, parliament uh, after the elections, and we've did all together the team uh, quite a few, a large uh, selection of them. So I did that. But um, I'm more interested in um, you know meeting people who can give me an additional uh, information or an additional idea on on uh, on what's what's happening because 
you can obviously not believe <laughs> what's in the news for a start or what uh, what is being portrayed as a as a political narrative from the political class. So you need to go behind and need to check. Is that true what he says? Or do you know anything more about this? And so you don't meet with party officials. Is that a your own policy or is that something that's is it frowned upon as an I don't see any reason in I'm not you know I I don't have the feeling but please uh, I'm here to learn correct me I don't have the feeling that um, political parties in this country have a distinct party program that's really interesting I don't think so we'll, so we'll get into the sensitive stuff yeah. later uh, we'll do the bit of back and forth <laughs> okay. later. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm giving you an entree yes. here. This is like the yes. appetizer. And so then, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not, I don't feel an urge to to meet twice with. Uh, so you could, if you chose to. Yeah, there's no I don't, yeah. I can. I have a lot of uh, leeway. Okay. I mean, there's hardly anything uh, Berlin tells me to do or not to do. So, um, with the exception of being unable, whether you want to or not, to communicate yeah. directly with Hezbollah members of, in government, not party officials. Is there any restriction? Not them either. Yeah. Oh. No. Or oh, you could if you wanted to. No, I don't want to. You don't want to. I, and I don't, I cannot do. Okay, so there's no other restriction in that sense. Um, I guess uh, it's not decent to meet with people who are on a sanction list. Okay. For a start. That's very diplomatic word. So you um, could if you chose to, but you don't need to, and therefore you're not. Uh, I don't, I could. I mean, there's no rule that, uh, yeah. you know, and if, like, if, uh, if Berlin says, you need to clarify this point with Gibran Basile, right. I, I could do it. Yeah. But I think it's not, uh, it's not appropriate. So we'll get into the value of those characters mm. Letter, mm. later, whether or not they're worth anything in terms of this kind of job. Yeah. Um, just in terms of packaging all of that yeah. into something digestible. How is that done? Are you trying to explain Michel Aoun to the foreign ministry? Are you, are you trying to package Nabih Birri in a sensible way so that he makes sense in Berlin? Uh, so what we do, and that's different from embassy to embassy, you have embassies that report daily in a, uh, a full report uh, to Berlin. We don't do this from here. We do, I would say, strategic reporting. We collect stuff over a period of times and, and put it into a uh, comprehensive and fully understandable uh, picture. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean that's that's how we that's how we deal with. Like we deal about we we talk about central bank uh, and not just only the latest uh, sort of uh, freezing of assets or something. So, so what does that look like? Is it a one-page memo a, or is that it's a, a report in a uh, specific? Uh, uh, form uh, with, um, I think, uh, maybe something like 10,000 signs, uh, 12,000 mm. signs, and it counts down, so you know when you've done too much, it right. doesn't send, so you need to cut. And um, then it's been, uh, you know, it's the team writes a draft, and uh, my deputy uh, Clear, clears it mostly all, and I just just sign it usually in the end. But we discuss it, uh, we discuss it uh, before what should be inside uh, inside the reporting, and then there's this is the this is the masterpiece of reporting. Then we have a daily report on uh, you know what what's new in the morning, and um, we have a lot of email contacts, of course, and we have a weekly uh, Skype meeting. Uh, where we can also do uh, detailed uh, explanations on the reporting and so on. So well, th thank you for letting me ask you the technical aspects, because I yeah. really don't know yeah. how this messaging is formed and where maybe good ideas or bad ideas come from. So let me push one step further. In your experience in this country, mm. and we'll go deeper into the more sensitive stuff, but 
in the last three years, have you felt that your ideas have been largely accepted by your superiors? Or have you been more of trying to message their concerns to local actors here? So in other words, your capabilities and whether or not anything you want to happen has actually happened. Yeah. So I, I guess overall, if we here uh, don't want something to happen, it doesn't happen. So you have the final say? No, but uh, we, we put the narrative in such a way that mm. Berlin believes it <laughs> and then has no chance to ask us for something w When else. should I air this, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, the narrative is being set by you. This is a country, and not only this country, but for so this is a country which is so difficult to understand that um, we don't ever get a, you know, a wiser opinion on anything than the one we sent back. There's not, there's, I don't think there's ever been a, uh, a, a response to a report, uh, there's been a response to a report that says, you're wrong. Uh, we know this, and please don't do what you propose to do or something. That's no. really interesting. So I don't think so. So your word is taken as the most credible of anyone trying to formulate policy towards this country. Yeah, I only remember one thing, and I, I'm still hurt. Uh, but that, is, that was global politics, so we couldn't do anything against it. Hmm. What was that? Uh, well, <clears throat> let's go into this later. Okay. <laughs> How much later? <laughs> We have two hours, you know. 8.59. Yes. As soon as the mic cuts off. Yeah. So that's really, it's, it's good to know that the way you're understanding Lebanon is treated with seriousness and credibility so that if there's interference, with the exception of that one incident, which sounds way beyond your domain or maybe Germany's, that at the end of the day, your voice is the winning voice, or it's the winning argument on policy by Germany to Lebanon. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I think we, we are, you know, this is part of, um, uh, we are here on the ground. We, uh, there's full trust in what this embassy is doing in terms of sources, analysis, uh, Uh, opinion and uh, proposals on, on actionable issues um, that, uh, yeah, I think Berlin listens, uh, takes in and, uh, and feels good with it. So mm. there's not a, yeah. Let me now go back in time to the moment you arrive in this country. And it's, I think, the worst time for anyone to mm -hmm. begin a career in Lebanon. You're really, you're the post-port blast disaster. And I think anyone trying to navigate this in terms of diplomacy or humanitarian aid or even Lebanese actors, uh, I mean, everything that we wanted to happen four years ago pre-blast has largely not happened. And the blast itself made a lot of those dreams disappear quickly. I was once, I mean, you, you allowed me graciously into your office and in Senate Field, way up in the sky, your view is hell. Mm. The silos, the damage beneath, and that's the view. So I think in a way, it's almost an appropriate view for someone arriving to this country that that's the disaster you're working against. And I know Germany has contributed a lot of positivity in terms of support. And a lot of the humanitarian support has actually helped this country immensely. So before we go into policy, before we get into impunity, geopolitics, all that, could you tell me concretely what Germany has done on the ground? And I know that the port blast itself, the aftermath, the cleanup, is mm -hmm. largely thanks to Germany mm -hmm. in terms of material hazardous waste but beyond that just the concrete steps germany has taken uh 
Okay, I arrived uh, with uh, my wife and our youngest daughter on the 28th of July, a week before the blast. And this was, uh, if you remember, this was still quarantine stuff. So yeah. we had to stay in the hotel for four days, five days. Basically, the 4th of August was my second working day. And uh, I've come back from a lunch and I was in the embassy. I went back to the hotel, Phoenicia Hotel. And we were in the room, my wife and uh, our youngest daughter. And then there was this explosion and the whole room was destroyed, as most of uh, Phoenicia. And uh, you, by, were, you were in the hotel. Uh, we the were bus. in the hotel. Yeah, and by miracle, there was we had no scratch. Then, but then we had to be moved to another hotel, then another hotel. Then we even went to a monastery for six weeks. Then we went to uh, an interim apartment, and then we went into our residence. Now, just last year, so the days after the. Uh, I mean, the, the day itself, uh, we couldn't go into the embassy because uh, there was, we were afraid that the building had got a shock. Yeah. And in fact, it had turned a little. The upper floors, 17th to 23rd floor, had turned by three centimeters, uh, turned back after during the next four months, uh, so we could go back into the building. But um, we couldn't at that moment. Um, but quickly after that, um, uh, started this idea of uh, uh, cleaning the port. Mm. And it was a special task which only very few companies can do in the world. So there was this German company um, trying to, you know, offer, offer itself to clean the, clean the port. And in the end, um, they took out uh, some 60 containers of chemical yep. waste. Um, which was a story in itself I really would love to tell <clears throat> because it shows all the uh, all the negligence, all the in lack of capacity in the state here, in the government. Uh, and it was just uh, unbelievable. And in fact, I'm after, in the aftermath, I'm, I'm very proud that we managed doing this, uh, which was almost impossible. Am I correct in saying that there was another potential, not necessarily a blast, but something could have happened in that near term and yeah. it was prevented? Is, yeah. that, is that correct? That, yeah, I yeah. guess so. I mean, we had, a, I was uh, a couple of times in the port and um, then there was this one meeting we had with the Minister of Public Transport at the time uh, it was about another signature, uh, one of, you know, maybe a hundred or whatever signatures to get this stuff out of the port. And he said he's really annoyed about this company because um, they claim that it could be a, different, uh, a second explosion and a second disaster like the first one. And uh, he asked me, is it really that bad? Meaning he's never been to the port. Sorry, who said this? Who? The minister. The minister of... Trans so no 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 no. Which minister said this? So I showed him. Uh, I showed him the photos I took from the containers where you have a uh, really you need to digest this. This is there was a container of uh, methyl bromide. This is some stuff which is forbidden in the civilized world since 2000. There was a container of methyl bromide in the port. Uh, uh, Next to it was, was a container with the sulfur acid. Next to it was a container with Chinese matches that ignite themselves. And the container had to be watered all the time in order not to avoid an, another explosion. So really there is a, it's, uh, it's an understatement to say that there was not a continuous threat from the disaster and from the mess in the port afterwards. So, uh, so when you, you were showing this information to a minister yeah, and the minister was being dismissive towards the company? Uh, no, not after I showed it to him. Ah, after okay. I showed it to him, he said, oh my God. But uh, yeah. before that, yeah. I see. So there's a, uh, yes, and there was all the, this kind of discussion, you know, on the day when they were taking out the containers. They wanted to take out, the ship was already there. They had yeah. cleaned everything. They wanted to take out the containers. 
they asked me, no, they can't take out the container now. They need to make a deposit in a Lebanese bank, five hundred thousand dollars, in right. order to take out the containers. I said, yeah. uh, there's no way. <laughs> yeah. There's no way we're doing this. Yeah. Uh, and we had to. I had to discuss it with them that we should not make this down payment of five hundred thousand dollars in order to take out. Yeah. Uh, the chemical waste. So it was really a mess. Uh, and uh, uh, now all of this clean and all of this, uh, ha this hazardous waste being cleaned in Germany, in Bremerhaven, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really proud that this has been done uh, because it was, it was a continuous uh, threat. So, but we were coming from this other question, like, uh, what do we do? No, I mean, but that's, that's important to acknowledge. And this kind of, this came on the news and then it quickly faded that Germany was being proactive about preventing another disaster at the port. Yeah. And the, the, can you walk me through the other, maybe they're not as dramatic as that, but the other humanitarian successes that have been accomplished? Uh, well, we, I, I give you a number because um, it's, you know, Last year, 2022, uh, Germany gave about 150 million euro for humanitarian aid to Lebanon and more than 200 million for economic development. Mm. So roughly 350 million. Yeah. With the numbers, it's a bit difficult because I, I read in a, another publication just two weeks ago, we gave last year 500 million, but I don't know anything about this. So the number I have is something like 350 million. Okay. And plenty of it goes into, you know, World Food Program, paying for uh, contributions to vulnerable Lebanese or uh, Syrian, Syrian refugees. Yeah. Um, this is a large part, World Food Program, but also other institutions, mostly international organizations, but also uh, NGOs. Uh, we give money to, so they spend it on uh, vulnerability, vulnerable uh, people, and so on. I, I tried looking at the numbers briefly before. That number is sort what of. What number did you find? No, I found consistency over the years. Oh, yeah. So that post 2019, yeah. that direct aid did not change that much. But what changed clearly is the port blast recovery, which cost in itself an enormous amount. Is there any other specific humanitarian work? effort that was done under your watch not not the maybe not the un agency type support or international more germany's direct rule mm, we do a lot of uh, cash for work uh, mm. contributions but this is also again uh, via for instance the ilo yeah right um uh, but maybe i i mentioned one other thing which has also got to do with waste because i like it a lot it's um it's about radioactive uh, waste. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether you know there's uh, the Lebanese Atomic Energy Commission in Robeiri. They have their building there. And in the five floors under the underground, uh, all the radioactive waste of Lebanon is collected. Uh -huh. uh, this is, of course, one of the most densely populated areas. And it's not appropriate. Uh, it's safe there. No worries. Uh, and there is the Lebanese Atomic Energy Commission is a great institution, very serious, professional, working together with the uh, IAEO and uh, internationally renowned. So uh, really appreciate the work of uh, Bilal and Suli and his, his team. Um, but of course, it's not the good place to have this radioactive waste in, <laughs> in the middle of Robeiri. Yeah. And... Um, there was a question coming from out of Robeiri whether we could do something uh, since we've done the stuff in the port. Uh, so we organized something from Berlin. There is a group coming. There was a group coming dealing with this feasibility study and so on and so on. And they looked at it for one and a half years. It's it's comparatively cheap, but I think it's a good it's a good project mm. to look for another place where to put it because this is not the best place to put it. So we're looking forward to maybe continuing this, um, but for now we have a, a good 
project uh, and it's 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 nice it's nice to do something uh, although it was frustrating in the beginning but it's nice to do something which is uh, obviously and objectively uh, a good thing so hazardous waste and yeah. waste management yeah so that successful story which is now three years ago mm. and time is going by very fast and I know that you're leaving your term early I think it was meant to be five years is that right four years F four years yeah okay so one year before one year earlier one year yeah. premature um, in the last I think three years um, I've been honored to sit at several round tables with you mm. some public I think last year it could be exactly today or yesterday, a year ago, we were sharing a stage with uh, Human Rights Watch, mm. with Legal Agenda, and I think it was the UN representative to Lebanon, if I'm not mistaken, who's now in Syria. Or maybe not. Najat. Najat, yes. yes. I, her last name escapes me now. Roshdi. Yes, thank you. And she, it was being hosted by Monica Borgman mm. and Rasha Lamir. I think the title was Justice for Lebanon. Mm. So the five or six of us on stage mm. in the sweltering heat, you know, mm. uh, talking about impunity. Mm. So that's a year ago. And we listened to each other speak for about two hours. In addition to that, private occasions where you've been gracious to include me among people that I would never meet otherwise. An advisor from the foreign ministries in town, mm. you suggest that I'm there and I'm there. And sometimes these are heated exchanges, but they're the right exchange. I think the right narrative is emerging from those debates. Mm. And also somebody that represents both Germany and I think is a member of either the European Union Commission for Human Rights. Is that the right title? Her, her, her official title escapes me, but she's a human rights, she has a human rights portfolio in the German government okay. and the EU. So mm -hmm. it's almost a back and forth. Mm. Her, her name escapes me now. <clears throat> Sitting with her, with Monica as well, and others. And I believe Nadim Shahadi was there as well. So I've gotten to know I can't you. can't remember. This is maybe half a year <laughs> ago or so. I've gotten to know you on serious occasions. Mm. And I think we've spent many hours talking about the same issues. And this is where I want to get into the more sensitive stuff. That fast? Okay. Yes, why not? Let's go there. Germany and the German ambassador and also trying to formulate narrative that you see correct where Berlin is listening to you as you said not listening to others and also being part of a much larger institution like the EU where sometimes it's not just messaging it's also words printed here not yours alone but a, a group effort I want you to take me into this process of how you and other ambassadors in this country come to formulate policy that makes sense to everyone. I can imagine this is a very difficult exercise. I know that most ambassadors do not agree on everything all the time. Mm. And I think that's the right approach. There should be some disharmony. But I'd like to go down that road and how you experienced it. Because Germany is among many other countries that have ambassadors here trying to communicate the same message over and over and over. And I want to understand why that was the right message to you and the other ambassadors and how it was formulated. I've been working, this is my second leg, so to say. I mean, my first leg is uh, the Middle East and uh, you know the Mediterranean stuff. Um, the second leg is European foreign policy. I've been working for seven years in European foreign policy. So what you are alluding to is uh, a very particular part of European policy. Mm. European foreign policy is done by member states, by the 27, uh, not by the Commission. So um, there needs to be, for now, there needs to be a consensus uh, among 27 in order to have a decision or a statement or any, you know, operational issue. They need, all need to agree on stuff. Um, this is, for instance, why we have a sanctions regime mm -hmm. on Lebanon. Yeah. But Annex 1, where you should find the names of those people sanctioned, is empty because... 
so far there's no consensus on even filling it or even the or the names who should be filled in but so there needs to be a consensus on everything and on a large part of foreign policy there is a very broad consensus among 27 you have specific issues where you know an individual country doesn't want to intervene and so on and so on but in general there's a there's a broad consensus on foreign foreign policy so we have our uh, different approaches maybe but uh, in the end there's a lot of agreement among uh, 27 in Brussels and here we are I think something like 20 yeah. uh, not yes. everyone is uh, represented mm. and we meet once a month uh, and we discuss a lot there's not a formally decision making process but uh, Ralph he he asked around do you want do you want us to do this or that and we agree on stuff so um, this is how it works and you need sometimes you need uh, a discussion or you need to convince someone but uh, in general there's a broad consensus on the definitely there's a very broad consensus on analysis on the situation in this country maybe not on what to do mm. necessarily afterwards but uh, we I think all agree on the situation in the country it's not someone who says Oh come on! Uh, this is this is party. This is how we should. Uh, you know, I'm not interested in this uh, other stuff and so on. So um, there's broad consensus on the situation here. I think so. Let's get into that broad consensus first before going into the more nitty gritty of how that consensus is achieved. Can you describe that broad consensus to me? What is the shared understanding yeah. of foreign policy towards this country? Um, state is uh, declining uh, informal economy is increasing this has become or is becoming a uh, difficult uh, situation in terms of uh, control of money mm. uh, this has become a difficult uh, situation in terms of um, what the future will bring um, for a state and for a regulated uh, economy and for social affairs because what we see is a um, minimum or less than minimum of uh, expenses on state institutions a uh, large area of informal economy with a US dollar cash uh, economy of course no trust into the banks no liquidity in the mm. in the banks a um, you know um, no lust for reforms uh, no sense of urgency among the political class everyone has his niche is happy with it um, so uh, I think in, in that so far there is a there is a very broad consensus on uh, on this but that's not so much foreign policy mm. that's more uh, Lebanon's ills from within. Yes, I was thinking more. Is there a consensus on how to approach Lebanon no. as a basket case, let's say, from the outside? Um, and and are, are local EU ambassadors <coughs> formulating that too? We have a uh, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a discussion on uh, and the reporting back from from EU member states. We have this instrument of. Uh, uh, heads of mission reports. Mm. We use it occasionally in, in Beirut. And in this report, we analyze the situation or we agree on a text that uh, Ralph prepares. Mm. And we have our nitty gritty stuff, but in the end, we all agree on the text. And um, then there is a, you know, uh, a toolbox the EU has um, what we could do, like support, uh, for instance, with a certain instrument called TIEX, uh, uh, instrument where a group of uh, lawyers comes by and uh, discusses with uh, government potential reforms in the justice sector and so mm. on and so on. Or we think of renewing the sanctions regime or we uh, discuss what uh, what sums of uh, money can be made uh, for uh, humanitarian um, aspects and so on. So there's a 
there's a toolbox uh, uh, the EU has, and we're not discussing uh, individual national issues. We're not mm, discussing mm. like uh, how much we could give or what else we could do uh, nationally, bilaterally, mm. but what the EU can do. So there's a yeah, there's a toolbox of of stuff. Yeah. So I, I heard sanctions as the maybe the most effective it's of one those. of i i personally i'm a friend of sanctions i've been looking into sanctions issues for seven years and i think it's uh, it can be helpful it's not the only tool yeah. you cannot use it as the one tool but i think it's it's helpful to threaten with it but at a certain point you need to <laughs> put names in the list so, so that step the missing yeah. step yeah. which you already mentioned earlier the what could be a sanctions regime that's yeah. EU's, EU EU approved, yeah. And then the appendix is empty, yeah. How does that happen? Is that where countries don't agree? Um, it's the usual way. Usually, you have a, a situation in the country in a country, and you think, okay, let's try uh, setting up a sanctions regime, and sometimes it helps without mm. putting names on it. Oh, it helps. Already, yeah, I mean, I think I would argue that uh, the sanction, setting up the sanctions regime helped in bringing about uh, parliamentary elections last May, for a start, I think. S sorry, I think. The, th uh, the threat of sanctions brought about elections? Not monocausally, mm. but it, I, I would argue that uh, it's part of a scenario where uh, it helped to say, you know, this is... Uh, if you prevent uh, democratic processes, this is one of the criteria. If you prevent democratic processes, you can be listed. So I'll save that for a little later because that's terrain I'd like to get into really. Mm. Uh, that's actually the, I think if there's going to be any disagreement, it'll be in that space, but I'll save that. Uh, but the list, uh, the annex, um, not necessarily is it uh, a disagreement in the beginning, but um, maybe we just, all 27 thought in Brussels that uh, the first step is enough for a start to have the sanctions regime. Uh, anyway, this was done, I think, in the last meeting before the summer vacation, so mm -hmm. you understand. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't uh, sit longer and discuss names. So. But let me, let me be devil's advocate here. I'm not, this is not necessarily disagreeing. It's actually trying to make, try to understand it. This was discussions that go back, I think, two years ago. It's not recent uh, conversations on applying that sanctions regime. It's to two years ago, actually. Two, yeah. two years, yeah. yeah. End of July 2021. Right. Yeah. So two years later, you would think one name would emerge by now. You cannot just have one name. You need to be fair. I mean. Oh, so you're going to be sectarian about your sanctions? I'm not. I I, I don't want to. Not, I don't want to say sectarian or confessional, <laughs> but. Uh, I guess... Uh, consensus on your sanctions. Yeah, there needs to be consensus among 27. And no, I meant consensus among... And <laughs> there needs to be a balance in a certain way, uh, I guess. What is... Oh, let me... It's not a problem in this case. Yeah. So why... Let's say that is the case. Yeah. Why aren't there a group of names yet in your best assessment? Is that where countries tend to disagree? Where there isn't that much harmony? And I, I, can, I can give you an example. I mean, I know this because I think a lot of us take it as fact. France is not always on the same page as Germany. I think that came out in the public several times. And not, not, not about Germany, about other countries too. Fr France took a particular view of this country from the beginning of the October uprising. Mm. And it took, I think, a more hardened view over time that didn't seem to be in sync with other countries and this other ambassadors here, the way they were explaining this problem. And I think that's true. And only recently was there some backpedaling. Is that where the friction comes in and then you can't have names together? Uh, in that specific case, no. No. Uh, because uh, I think there's... Uh, Germany and France are like this on sanctions. Oh, on sanctions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You will have a problem if you want to sanction someone who has a second nationality, a European nationality. That could be a problem. I'm I not see. encouraging anyone to 
I acquire see. second European nationality now, but um, this is a, this could be a difficulty. Right. Um, Has that actually happened where somebody's... In other sanction regimes? Yeah, sure. No, no, I mean, in this country, were there people that got off the list because they have French passports? There hasn't been a list so far. There's no list so far, I see. There's just ideas. Yeah. You know? uh, so why, why not? Why isn't there a list yet? Uh, I know it's summer, fine. It's been yeah. three summer seasons have passed. We're just about to renew the sanctions regime. And I guess, uh, you know, there's, it's, a, it's also a question of um, uh, some member states thinking, no, 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 we're not, it's, not, it's not the right timing now. Uh, or no, let's give them a last chance. Or there's mm. a lot of discussion like this. So mm. I think with a, um, an increasing appetite for, uh, or an increasing frustration with what's happening here, It's not unlikely that uh, you know discussions after summer, uh, when they come to uh, to the subject of Lebanon in 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 Brussels, people will stand up and will say, uh, "Let's rethink this whole thing and let's discuss names." It's quite it's I, it's not unlikely actually because there's a lot of a lot of frustration uh, with the, with Lebanon and with the uh, you know with the. The, the lack of sense of urgency, the lack of reforms, and so on. So, yeah, it's been brewing. And uh, if, and then you have a couple of uh, um, parameters on filling an annex like this, which is, for instance, usually in other sanctions regimes, we've hardly ever sanctioned members of parliament unless they have a specific uh, issue. We've hardly ever sanctioned uh, heads of state. We hardly ever sanctioned journalists uh, because freedom of press and so on. So there are a few parameters. And then ideally, you would, uh, you would not start with just one person. You would, you would bring up a group. I'm sorry to push one step further. Uh, Who's the kind of person then that would be sanctioned? Is Depending. I mean, in this context, I guess not, um, I mean, not party leaders. Who? Maybe those who prepare the, you know, for signature or, I don't know. I mean, uh, really, I don't know. Oh, There's not I a, see. so it's, it's, you wouldn't, this is already a, a this is already a uh, high level of escalation to have a, you know, we, No, because you, said, you said something mm. bold, which is that threat ushered in what could not have happened, which are parliamentary elections. So if there's a serious threat embedded in, who's the kind of person that is afraid if it's not an MP or a member or a high level member of a party? Who's the kind of person that's going to be afraid? Uh, you know better how this system works here. I, I don't know I mean, about that. I mean, you know, I think who you, you know the actors much better than I do. No, no, no. But you, you know who, like, who is paying for a campaign of a member of parliament? Oh, uh, sanctioning like this, the I mean, money behind... I don't need to sanction the member of parliament if, uh, you know, if I threaten to sanction the guy who paid for his campaign. Uh, I see. Stuff like this. I okay. mean, I'm not uh, really, this is not, it's got nothing to do with reality. No. What I was saying. So it's the money flow that could be more directly impacted than individuals in positions... One of the criteria is uh, linked to corruption and uh, and so on. So I guess that could be uh, that could be an entry. Yeah. I'm asking all these questions about this subject because the. I one guess you will not be on the list if I'm that's not? what you want to. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. I have another passport. I guess not. <laughs> you should be able to sanction dual citizens. Let, let me push further now. Because this is exactly where I wanted to go. Uh, a very determined drive by a collective of EU ambassadors to do what you just said, which is force local actors to make difficult decisions for the better. And all of that is summed up in a timely piece. It's still online. It's called The Time to Act is Now. And I think it's in Lorient today. But in French, Lorient Le Jour, it was published everywhere, but that's where I found it. 
Uh, it's co-authored by by many EU member ambassadors, but I think sort of the top author is Ralph Tarraf. Now, I'm lucky because when I read something and I don't agree with one word in it, I can call the author. And he's very, very generous. We had a back and forth. We talked about other things too, but we had a long back and forth about how we both don't see the country the same way, which is, I think, that's correct. He should not see Lebanon the way I do. Yeah. He's an EU ambassador to yes. Lebanon. He's not a guy with a belly on a chair talking mm. and talking and talking. But he, I think, came to a different conclusion than I expected from somebody in his shoes. And that's where the back and forth happened. This article, and you tell me if I'm saying anything wrong here, the ethos of the article is putting all the agency on local actors. Meaning, let's, for a moment, look away from regional problems and geopolitical problems. Let's look away from the implications of the port blast too. Let's look at local actors and what they're able to do and push them to do the right thing. That article was published, I think, also roughly two years ago, mm. give or take. That kind of article to me is the kind of article that I've read so many times. And the message has been communicated so many ways, sometimes by the same country and could be also the same. And it could be different ambassadors from the same country, too, meaning there's a conclusion that's being reached all the time. Mm. Yet everything in that article doesn't happen. And I'd like to go down this road with you. Mm. Can you tell me at this point whether there's anything in that framework, the way that expecting Lebanese to do better. Do you still hold to that and say that is the right path forward? It just means Michel Aoun, when it was written, should do the right thing. It means Tarbitar, everyone in his way should just step aside and let Tarbitar do his investigation. And is there anything there that you maybe look back on and say it's not exactly the way it is? I'm, I'm also arguing the same way as uh, as Ralf yes. because I'm, I think, you know, as I said in the beginning, I, and I need to be humble in this because uh, I can never, I can never understand uh, a country as I probably understand my own country, and I know what to do maybe in my own country to achieve stuff. Here, I just have an idea, um, but, uh, and I have, uh, I, I, I think I, I want to achieve something for, for this country, uh, but I'm frustrated uh, and I'm not sure I, I do it the right way. And I, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, on the contrary, I'm, I can be sure I'm not doing it the right way because I'm not Lebanese. Uh, so my assumptions on on the political system uh, here they might be completely wrong, and I I should not, as a foreign ambassador, uh, octroi my ideas, my assumptions, mm. uh, how things should be done on on Lebanese actors, because in the end, it's your country. I I dislike the landfill. And I have to see it every day. It's 30 meters now, and uh, it's just horrible. Uh, I dislike uh, the corruption I'm seeing. I'm, you know, uh, but I, I really in think this is what uh, where where I have to stop. I'm not an I'm not an activist. But I might have the same. That article was written with an activist tone. It was written with a, an activist tone, but considering the limitations uh, foreign ambassadors have, we cannot. Yes. Uh, we cannot. I mean, I can threaten sanctions. I can. I can say, okay, this is being done now, and if you don't, uh, but um, this is the the, the 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 furthest I can I can go. Mm. I cannot. Uh, you know, I cannot threaten. I cannot go to someone and and say. 
I, I, you know, whatever. I mean, I, it's not my, um, it's not my job. It's not my mm. my mandate to to do this. So I have to I have to stand outside. I can go, you know, one ambassador goes that far, another ambassador goes that far. But there's a there is a line where we where we have to stop and have to leave it to the to the instruments and the institutions of uh, of that country. What mm. we can do, and I think what we should do, is. Uh, Build up those institutions, encourage those institutions. But um, um, you know, we cannot uh, drag a corrupt politician out of his office. And uh, right. you know, I meant more the emphasis on local agency and the spirit of that piece, which was let's try to step away from the region for a moment mm. and look inside. That kind of narrative. Does that stick with you over time? Hmm. And I'm not asking you to disagree with Ralph Tarraf. It's not that. It's more, do you come to a different conclusion looking back on what was... It's a, it's a familiar signaling, which is the country's local actors need to behave better, and then things will improve. Has any of that shifted from your from your experience, yeah. I mean, I, I think my my tools are on on my side. What I need to do is I need to convince my own people. For instance, if I say, uh, if I agree with the IMF saying, don't put an, a single dollar into the system mm. because it just feeds the same people again and again. Mm. If I agree with that uh, s- statement scenario, I need to go back to Berlin and say. Why don't you stop economic development support for a little while? Why don't we stop mm. uh, feeding into a social security system which should be the sovereign task of uh, of a country? Um, so I, I I can see my I can see my possibilities rather going back to my people instead of uh, you know. Uh, Going into the into the local actor's uh, mind, I think that's. I need to be careful there. I cannot. Uh, no, I mean not here now. But uh, I need to. Uh, this is. I need to treat people like uh, you know, respectful, like uh, individuals that have their own. Uh, I cannot continue telling people you need to do it that way, that way, that way. You know, people claim that I I say that Syrian refugees should be integrated, which is a complete lie. It's not true. Now, there's a spliced video of you on Twitter just from saying? different art, different, uh, it's different segments oh, of yeah. the same, like yeah, it's, it's, but, it's spliced to make you look like you're saying the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's forged uh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I come from a different experience. We, we did this, or we're doing this in Germany, and we have... Uh, experiences with it. Uh, I'm not saying this is a good experience for Lebanon. So I'm not saying it. Uh, I'm mm. not, uh, on the contrary, I'm explicitly saying I cannot compare the two countries. So I'm, I, with my proposals, with my advice, I'm, I need to be uh, respectful. Mm. So I, I think it's up to the local actors. And I, yeah. I Did you say that. you cannot compare the two countries, meaning Germany and Lebanon? How we deal with Syrian refugees. How to deal with yeah. Syrian refugees, yeah. I see. Well, I'll, we'll get into the emotion yeah. behind that messaging online. We'll put that towards them because I think that deserves a bit of time. And I think a lot of, a lot of it is miscommunication and misunderstanding mm. and time passing mm. and the worst instincts emerging online. Mm. I think that is yeah. happening. But we can save that to the end. Um, refugee population percentage aside... Um, the last meeting I had, which was with this human rights minister, I wish I remember her name now, uh, we were talking about a favorite author of ours, Milan Kundera, okay, who, who died away. last week. Mm. He was age 94. Mm. And I think I even joked in that I was trying to get him on the podcast, but I don't know how to reach him. <laughs> this guy would have been the highlight to talk to Milan Kundera. I think the way he wrote about a story that's neither mine nor yours, the Czech Republic, mm. Czechoslovakia and Prague, 
is a very local, very particular experience. And they went through something that is uniquely theirs. Mm. But there's a commonality that I think shaped the future of that part of the world and it reshaping this part of the world. It shaped, I think, Central and Eastern Europe for the better. And I think it reshaped this part of the world into a disaster. And Milan Kundera, I think, was right. All of his literature around, around catastrophe and society losing its way and the decay of institutions, the rot of what was once proud nations, mm. and his own case, Prague, which he loved until he died in Paris, security matters. And that part of the world got rid of its nightmare. And I know we've said this in private several times, and I'm sorry to repeat it here. It's quite important. Ta'if agreement, which ended our civil war, is signed two days into the Berlin Wall's demolition by people, people removing a wall that separated them for a generation, two days, and Lebanon civil war is ending. So if you can use that as a timeline, Berlin, and I think everything that was attempted in East Berlin and East Germany during the Cold War is I think everything we are trying to do here. I don't think there's any difference. People cannot change their predicament. Not because they don't want to, it's because there's a security arrangement that prevents it. So this is where my disagreement with the time to act is now comes from. It's asking Eastern Europeans to, it's asking those politicians to do better in the 1970s and 1980s when there's direct threat from above. We're facing the same thing, except it's not next door. It used to be next door. Now it's a few countries over. And I th it should be said, Germany doesn't have relations with Syria, the Syrian regime. And Germany, like we said earlier, you don't have direct relations with Hezbollah officials here. Or for that matter, you cannot in terms of policy. So I know I'm putting this on somebody that it's maybe a bit unfair and that Germany does take a certain stand. But I don't think asking Lebanese to do more is the right method. I think it's like Milan Kundera asking his compatriots in Prague and those politicians that he ran away from to just behave better. Moscow determined that country's fate. Tehran determines ours today. Why isn't any of that in the messaging when it comes to at least European diplomacy in Lebanon? Why is there a deliberate shelving that? And it, it happens even up until today, when mm -hmm. you have visiting dignitaries that just do the routine twirl and come out empty-handed and somehow blame Lebanese for being Lebanese, while Iran and the Syrian regime today are getting the upper hand once more. Mm. I disagree with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You should have seen my disagreement in the mountains last weekend. <laughs> For those that were there. <laughs> um, That's why you're an ambassador. <laughs> uh, 1989, I mean, uh, it's, it's got to, you know, I, I was on the West side and we never thought uh, this wall will fall. It's, it was forgotten as a scenario. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, I, I guess it's fair to say that it started with uh, leniency uh, on the Hungarian side, uh, with uh, constant demonstrations by East German citizens. Yes. Uh, you know, we are the people. So, in fact, uh, it was driven by Lebanese, if you want. It was, uh, it was exactly what, what, you, what you don't want to hear, mm. namely that this did come from a, uh, it was, if you want, a popular uprising, a popular unrest, a 
regulated every Monday demonstrations uh, until this uh, regime broke. So, uh, and it had a prehistory in other Eastern European countries. So, I think, uh, but again, this is one point where even after three years, I'm, I'm still learning mm. because uh, 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 what, can you, what, can, what can I ask Lebanese to do? And I think I can ask, as a foreign ambassador, I can ask to uh, to not uh, you know to not uh, to resist to continue to come up with the problems uh, we have and not to not to be complacent not to be uh, uh, you know uh, not to be uh, you know, satisfied with the situation as it is because it's not it's not normal it's not normal what's happening here so um, and I I don't agree that uh, you know I, I don't I don't like this idea maybe it's partly true it's not black and white mm. but I don't like the idea that the the fate of Lebanon and the Lebanese is being instrumentalized or <coughs> You know, uh, done by and 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 determined by uh, by countries outside or by the French or by the Americans, by the Iranians, Saudis, whoever you want to name. I think it's a. Um, uh, I think it it's 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 in the hands of the Lebanese. Really, at this point, Absolutely. you still believe this? Yeah, I still believe so that. So then, let me push a bit further. Yeah. Why do you believe that? After the last three years of what you've seen happen to Lebanon, mm. and you can draw a line going back in time to see that this is a downfall. Yes. It's not something that just started three years ago. Yes. You wouldn't put the overwhelming burden on a rotten regime that has destroyed the better part of this part of the world. You really wouldn't put the focus on that terrible military dictatorship in Tehran that sent Lebanese boys to fight on behalf of one of the worst regimes in modern history mm. and help send a lot of Syrian refugees, not just to Lebanon, but mm. to, Syria, to Germany. Mm. You wouldn't put the burden on the worst security arrangement that has demented Islam, cosmopolitanism. We now talk about partition in this country. No. No. I think, uh, you know, the, the way how, and you can see it every day, like... Uh, we're talking about Liban Post, we're talking about the, the airport, we're talking about all those things. Mm. Uh, and I still believe that's got, that's got little to do with Iran. Yeah, you're it's, right. Liban Post has nothing yeah. to do with Iran. So this is uh, really a decision by uh, local actors to... You know, I, I, I tell you one, one thing which really uh, I learned recently. There's... Um, I think this is the only country in the world where uh, your passport, your Lebanese passport, is printed abroad in a state printing company, but not sold to general security or the Ministry of Interior, but to an individual who then sells it to general security. I don't think this is, a, it's got nothing to do with Iran. And this is perfect, you know, this is the way how this system works, I think. And it should, uh, you know, I, I think we should start there because this is easier in a certain sense. It is easier. Thank you for saying that. I agree. It's, it's, I completely agree. The lack of address recognition in Lebanon which makes half the country insane any day, trying to send something anywhere can drive any individual mad. Mm. I agree with that. And uh, there are clearly among the most corrupt politicians known to this planet that some of them even live up the hill. One of them is a fugitive from Japan who smuggled himself in. He's five minutes away from here. There's all these weirdos that love mm. Lebanon for the wrong reason. Mm. I agree with that. Some of them pretend to be reformers. Some of them pretend to do other things. I agree. They're not the reason Lebanon is dead. They have nothing to do with why your job has mm. so many limitations. Mm. I, I, there's no link. Liban Post, 
and the aftermath of economic disaster and geopolitical terror, mm -hmm. which tore the city apart, they're separate stories altogether. Let's agree that they complement the uh, Really? Page. <laughs> you think so? No, because I, I like that you're... Okay, so you believe that they fit into the same story. They're different pieces of the same puzzle. I think it is uh, unwise to think that there's a black and white picture. I think really I, I, I can convince myself to agree with you that uh, there is a regional element. Yes. yes. Um, but mainly for me, this is a local issue that can be or should be solved uh, here, I think. So then, one more question before yeah. we go into the Syrian refugees. <laughs> Let me ask you then a very bold question. How do Lebanese solve this issue locally? No, I don't have any good advice for that. Sorry. I... Uh, there is a... There is a difference within the international community on the definition of stability of Lebanon. That's true. That is true. So uh, some would say, don't rock the boat. This is stable enough. Just let, let's kick down the can. <laughs> let's kick the can down the road. Right. And others would say, France. this is not sustainable. Uh, there needs to be a change. Germany. So um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't have any concrete advice on what to do. But um, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I try to do what I what I can. I mean, I involve myself into, uh, for instance, the uh, investigation into the port blast because I lost a colleague. Uh, she was killed on the fourth of August. And there's a second uh, uh, German national, uh, Isaac Oehlers, who, who, was, who was killed. And colleagues of mine were heavily wounded, had to be evacuated. So I feel, I feel entitled to intervene there. Uh, um, but I, I have no, no good advice for, for Lebanese how to... How to make it right? I can't imagine Milan Kundera's dreams coming true unless the Soviet Union, the way it mismanaged its security overreach, mm. I can't imagine his dreams coming true without that chapter ending. Okay, but we're seeing this already. Iran is overstretching. You know, there's no normalization with Syria. Even... Uh, even if even no normalization with Syria from who from well I mean what you see now in within the Arab League is a uh, you know it's the idea of a normalization but it's not happening I mean even the minimal goals individual Arab countries had to achieve with Syria they're not achieving it so over time I don't think they can uh, normalization will will become a reality because they also uh, see that nothing of what uh, the regime promised will materialize. So how can that be uh, satisfying? I mean, we could save that for a little later. I'll get into that. No, because I, I don't see it that way. We'll, we'll save that for yeah. the last step. Um, You're saving a lot. so. Well, there's no, that's the last part. Yeah, yeah, I'll save it for the end. And then I promise there's a break and a nice Q&A. <laughs> Um, if the answer is local agency and you mentioned protests among East Berliners and Poland and brave, brave souls, mm. many of them paying the <laughs> ultimate price for decades on end, war, uh, Budapest, Prague, yeah. uprisings, yeah. and then eventually that disorder dies. And now yeah. you go to Romania and it's a different country. It's a different story altogether. You go to East Berlin. No one can compare East Berlin to Beirut today. There's no reason to. That, that nightmare is over. Do you think that local actors 
can do anything about this disorder from here. And the reason I'm asking this is because I always thought it's not the local population's uh, terrain to do that, because the only option to do that is violence. Betting on an end to a security regime locally is war. It's a war against a security regime. I thought external powers that could engage that player would be doing that more. Meaning, Macron would not be sending his advisors to Lebanon to try to shove Sleiman Frangi down our throat and then try to shove him out. They would be direct talks with Iran. Mm. And that would be the consensus that Iran is the dominant actor. That didn't seem to happen. Mm. It was more in, let's, like you said, stabilize. And stabilize in a way that turns Lebanon into an abnormal country for many more years. I think that is what's happening. And the expectation for locals to do more doesn't really, it doesn't land right. That's why I said I'm, I, I don't have a good advice because I, I realized, uh, you know, what you said. I mean, the, the heroism, the courageous people, mm. um, this is, um, This is uh, this is difficult for me to you know to to advise because uh, I'm not in their shoes. I leave after three years or four years and goodbye. I'm not under threat anymore. Uh, but those people who are courageous here, they are under threat all the time. And um, this is why I not I'm not uh, in the position to say, "Come on, move." <laughs> Move, move, be courageous, because this is uh, this can end uh, badly. Mm, mm. Um, so I don't know. I I really don't. I don't have good advice for this. I maybe you don't have the right advice, but your heart's in the right place. Up until today, you don't need to. On your Twitter cover photo, it's two friends of ours, mm. Monica Borgman and Lukman Slim, and I know that what you would want to happen is not happening. And I know that you know this too, that no matter what Monica wants, locally, it won't happen. So that's where I mean by the wider story of a country going through hell. I don't think Monica can do more, and I don't think anyone could do more than they already have. I somehow think the answers are not here. Okay, I'm, on that case, I'm not so sure. Because, uh, you know, there's a, it took a long time, it takes a long time, uh, there's a judge, who deals with the case. Uh, there's a police file on the case. Oh, come on. This is... You can't buy into this bullshit. Please. The police file so what? tells you details on... There's a police file into my father's assassination. Yes. It's been there for 10 years. So yeah. what? But if this police file becomes public, which oh, it would... No, no, in no, a, no. Um, well... I mean, okay, there's a difference. No, then. no, but why, no, no, but tell me why you. I'm, I'm interrupting you. I know. Yeah. Why do you Why do you buy into that? So what? Well, if the police fi if there is a if there is a trial. I see. It's the hypothetical. Uh, well, I mean, we are moving slowly uh, on the file. So if there is a trial. The police file will become public, parts of it, and then it will become clear who, who has the agency to kill Lukman. It's uh, it's it's become it becomes clear out of the police file. You have in the police file you have details, so you know that uh, if it if it uh, if it comes to it, there's a there's a there's a chance, you know. And this is how how I see what we can do. In terms of support, we would love to do, and we're working on it. But um, what I love about going to East Berlin when I can is going to the KGB museum hmm. and imagine a Mukhabarat Hasbullah museum in Beirut. <laughs> then I would imagine the trial. And everyone says, of course it was Hasbullah. We knew that from day one. Hmm. That's not the Lebanon that, you're, you're right. What you're saying is right. It's not maybe the role of an ambassador to say otherwise either. Mm. I think it's, you're setting the expectations. But is it fair to also acknowledge that the expectations and reality 
are not aligned right now? Not right now, no. Okay. Let me wrap it up with the Syrian refugee crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being nice in terms of me pushing all uh, as far as I can on these issues. I'd like to suggest that there's severe misunderstanding and sometimes quotes are misattributed or policies are not fully understood. I don't think Europe wants Lebanon to pay the price for Assad regime survivability. And I think many European countries, in particular Germany, have opened their doors extensively to the refugee population. So it's not black and white the way many local reporters make it seem. There's a lot of xenophobia. There's a lot of unrest in Lebanon and a lot of accusations. Crime and all types of misattributions to the refugees, it's become the norm. Could you best explain what Europe would like to see in terms of refugees, whether there's resettlement ideas that have already started? Is there going to be more distribution down the road? Is there any concern for the burden here? While not speaking the language of hate, resentment, and, and sometimes pure prejudice. Okay, so I say this uh, not as if you were a government uh, minister mm. I'm talking to, but really the the you know the the work or the uh, you can call it work or the the fact that uh, Lebanon has received one and a half million Syrian refugees is uh, unbelievable. It's uh, fantastic. It's sort of a strong signal of uh, the way how this country has a, uh, you know, I'd say a culture of uh, welcoming and uh, a culture of uh, accommodating uh, neighbors. It's not the only neighbors they've, uh, the Lebanese have received. Uh, yep. So, and it has cost uh, this country a lot financially, uh, foremost financially, I would say. Um, there is also a, uh, uh, a, a history which needs to be taken into account. And I think uh, often this idea of, uh, of, uh, of acknowledging what uh, Lebanon has, has done is lacking in uh, a lot of the discussions uh, or a lot of what international community is saying. It's not, it's maybe the, the first word they say, but not necessarily what they feel, because it is really something enormous. Mm. Uh, it's also understandable that in times when uh, economic crisis has uh, produced more poverty among Lebanese, this is, a, I think, I would say it's a natural, a natural reaction to say, to look what what do others receive, what what do I not receive, and so on, and this whole discussion of uh, why are you only paying, and so on. Um, what I would like to see is a. I would like to see a uh, discussion between international community and UNHCR, uh, other international organizations that deal with refugees, on the one side and or not on the one side, but uh, together uh, with the government, mm. the Lebanese government. Because what we are not, uh, we've been trying to do this for quite some time. There has been difficulties doing it. There was a lot more in terms of uh, public rhetoric and less in terms of uh, behind the doors pragmatic solution uh, searching. Uh, it has started now. And uh, I think it's fair to say that also from our side, there needs to be steps being taken because uh, it's, not, uh, it's not in our interest as donor to uh, put it bluntly, to pay for 1.5 million Syrian refugees if there are not 1.5 million Syrian refugees. They either there are 1 million, because 500,000 are the usual seasonal workers, 
they have been before, mm. or it's two million or two and a half. So we need to know more about this. We need to know who really is a refugee and uh, how does this fit in our into our programs. And um, so I think this discussion is is needs to come. And uh, I, we're looking forward to this discussion. It, it's happened, started to happen on a technical on a technical level. Not that I support this or advocate for any of this, but is there any discussion on relieving some of that burden here? Well, this is uh, what. First of all, not not by sending them to Syria, not that not that as a first step. No, both is happening. You know that uh, GS has uh, their registration centers uh, around the country, and I think. In the process we have seen last year, um, uh, there was a selection process of uh, Syrians who wanted to voluntarily, wanted to go back home and mm. have nothing to fear when they go back mm. in their own perception. Mm. Uh, and uh, after checking with the Syrian uh, intelligence service and so on, there was, uh, I think, uh, altogether maybe 500, 700 people leaving back. There is a resettlement process uh, like Germany is taking every year something like 1,200 uh, Syrian refugees from Lebanon to Germany, and other countries are doing the same. So I think all in all, it's uh, 10,000 a year. It's not a. It doesn't seem to be a big number, mm. but it is a uh, considerable number, considering the fact that uh, I mean, it's. I think it's broad consensus that a refugee would like to stay as close to the place where he comes from as possible. So it's not necessarily that it serves him right when he goes to America or Europe. But of course, uh, uh, there's no easy way to uh, relieve this, this if, you, if, you want to, if you want to call it burden uh, here, because um, there is... Uh, a full agreement with all Lebanese governments in the past and this one that there will be uh, no policy of uh, refoulement, that there will be a uh, return only uh, dignified, voluntary and safe. So by uh, international law and by poli policy decisions, uh, all the Lebanese governments and the international community agree that there should be no deportations. So that kind of status quo, if I understood this right, is that the percentages taken at the moment, which are very, very small, the way you, the way you mm -hmm. described it, there's no indication of that increasing even when there's discomfort in terms of distance, that there's no immediate decision to no, there's no, the, no. No, there's okay. no immediate decision to increase the number of resettlement uh, in within the international community. Okay. No. Yeah. What, I mean, what I would want is, you know, the Lebanese government has chosen uh, to come closer to the Syrian regime since Prime Minister Miati is uh, in charge. Uh, I would hope that uh, discussions between the Lebanese and the Syrian government, uh, you know, progress in terms of facilitating and securing a dignified, safe and voluntary return of Syrian refugees to Syria. Uh, and that those, uh, uh, you know, visits of Lebanese uh, government ministers in Damascus are not just uh, visits for the press or for talking, but uh, real uh, efforts to uh, relieve this burden. You know it's bad news when the Lebanese regime is getting closer to the Assad family again, and Lebanese ministers go to speak to Bashar al-Assad, mm. a former president goes and comes back. I think, unfortunately, in that terrible dilemma, uh, it's the unfortunate Syrian refugees that are paying the highest price. And I think the way you're describing it, it's true on both sides. Europe has done a lot on its own. Remove Lebanon. Leban the European countries have taken in millions of Syrian refugees, Germany on its own. But maybe not enough was done over time to placate Lebanese concerns and that Lebanon 
Lebanese do feel like at times they're paying the highest price for no reason other than what you're saying, which is keep them as close as you can to Syria. And in that terrible situation, they suffer the most too. And then the Assad regime comes out back on its feet, speaking the language of reform once more. It's a really tragic end. And that's why in the three years you've spent here, I think that's why I'm always pushing on the other side, which is that's the story. Hmm. It's not Lebanese actors that are capable of doing better. That's the story is there. But anyway, I've already taken up a lot of your time and I want to save some time for the Q&A. So you're very generous. Thank you for letting me push you diplomatically. Uh, let's take a five minute break, order whatever you'd like. A shout out to Monica Bergman, who's sitting right in the middle. One of my favorite guests and friends as well. Thank you for coming. Five minute break and we'll have a Q&A after. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Thank you. He's back. <laughs> the man is back. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You know what? This is a nice time. Let's give Sam a round of applause. He deserves it. I didn't ask him to do this, but I'm going to do it now. Uh, he's a terrific audio engineer. He spent four hours in Hamdoun last week pulling off the best sound quality of I've experienced. Um, there's a film program starting soon as well. He's the mastermind behind it. So I'm going to just ask everyone to follow him on Instagram, Samir Beham. And what's the name of the film program? Uh, well, it's the Beirut Film, uh, Beirut film Center. It's something we have started recently. Um, and we're doing a basic boot camp for filmmakers or filmmaker, oh, wow. uh, people who want to become filmmakers. If you like his audio quality, you'll like his filmmaking too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we get to the q and I just want to quote, the, um, quote Andreas, not the ambassador. Quote Don't. Andreas, word for word. I have to do this. <laughs> So right, right as we switched off the mics, I said, you know, thank you for letting me grill you. And he's like, you grilled me like halloumi. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't tell if that's flirtation or <laughs> diplomacy. Look, enta sandwich halloumi ya Saad Safir. Just because I like halloumi? <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you. Thank you for liking halloumi. That's one of the best lines I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remove that if you want me to. <laughs> the most sensitive moment of the episode. Yes. So we have a guest in the audience who paid us $20 to go first. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> There's a gentleman that went up to Hamdoun, Mark, uh, sitting with the blue shirt. He waited four hours. There was no time for his question. So you get the first question tonight. Be gentle. I will try. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Ambassador. Good evening, Roni. My name is Marc Elion, and I'm a student at Sciences Po Paris. Allow me, Mr. Ambassador, to speak on behalf of a silent majority in Lebanon. A silent majority fed up with the German and European policies in Lebanon regarding the Syrian refugee crisis. On the one hand, you claim to be helping the Lebanese people by granting them uh, humanitarian uh, aids, and we're grateful for that. But on the other hand, your country's approach, at least in my, op my opinion, to the Syrian refugee crisis is leading us to a demographic genocide with terrible consequences on Lebanon's identity and entity. Today, Lebanon hosts more than two million refugees. That's a third of the country's population. Out of seven births, six are Syrian. Not to mention the hundreds of Lebanese who are leaving the country every day. In the meantime, Germany, the EU, 
and the international community are helping the uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon with tremendous financial aids. In every statement and in every resolution, for example, the one voted last week by the European Parliament, you keep on saying that conditions are not met for the voluntary, dignified return of, ref of refugees in conflict-prone areas in Syria. And allow me to say, Mr. Ambassador, that this is the biggest lie. First, because the war in Syria is over. I'm sorry, but this is a fact, and Germany will have to deal with it sooner or later. Second, because many Syrians are traveling on a daily basis to Syria. So how are these people considered as refugees? I don't know. Actually, according to a study conducted by the Syrian Future Movement, which is well known for its anti-Assad views, 83% of the Syrian refugees are not threatened by the Syrian regime. So instead of helping the Syrians in their country, Germany, the EU, and, and the international community are working to keep them in Lebanon. You have a problem with Bashar al-Assad? Well, you're not the only one. But allow me to say that you have no right to bet on Lebanon's future. One last word, Mr. Ambassador. If your country is not aware of the situation here in Lebanon, it's a problem. But if your country is aware of it, but continue to act in that sense, then it's not just a problem, but a disaster. Thank you. So that's more of a statement, really, than a question. But if there's any particular angle you want to address. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mark, for that statement, which uh, I, I've not heard the first time, of course. Uh, so this is not so silent a uh, majority. Um, on the numbers, I don't want to go into it because uh, I've been, I'm looking for numbers uh, and I don't think we have these numbers. I'm not saying that the numbers uh, will differ uh, tremendously from what you say, but we cannot base policy on uh, rumors or uh, speculation. What we need for policy is numbers. This is why we started or tried to engage with the Lebanese government a uh, long time ago. And in fact, it was uh, our initiative, German Embassy, to uh, bring together donors and UNHCR in order to formulate a position in order to go towards the Lebanese government. Because Without the Lebanese government, I don't think we can, you know, we need to, we're not executive uh, agents in this, in this country. This is Lebanon. This is the Lebanese government. When the uh, European Parliament in its uh, resolution last week says uh, the conditions are not, we want to stress that the conditions are not right, um, then this is the opinion of uh, a majority of those who uh, voted in favor of this resolution. Uh, as you know, this is parliament. It's got nothing to do with member states or governments or uh, executive even. In fact, uh, they ask in that same paragraph the commission to do more. They ask member states to do more. So um, I I cannot understand uh, really the uh, the excitement about this one paragraph in the European Parliament resolution, paragraph 13 out of 17. Uh, and I think it's a uh, it's a distraction because the rest of the resolution, if you've read it, and if the silent majority has read it, I think. Uh, it would be able to see the opportunities that come out of these other 16 paragraphs and not focus on paragraph 13 and uh, do all this uh, exciting activity like uh, foreign minister writing a letter and uh, every party in the country uh, giving a statement on paragraph 13 and not seeing the rest of the other 17 paragraphs. So uh, I think... Um, a lot of what you, I, I, I'm, I'm fully with you in terms of uh, 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 anger 
in terms of disappointment, dissatisfaction, what you expressed, on the, um, on the reaction uh, and action of uh, international community. And I, I, I mentioned this earlier. There's a, I think there is a lack of uh, appreciation from the international community of what Lebanon and the Lebanese have been uh, doing, offering, and uh, presenting in the last uh, 11 years since there is the, Leban the Syrian crisis. I disagree with you on um, your statement that the war is over in Syria. Uh, I think this is a deeply personal sentiment of someone who has not, who runs not the risk to be uh, taken into prison uh, in Syria when he goes there. So I think um, there is a different reality from the reality that the major silent majority here sees when they uh, uh, watch the news on, on, on Syria. So I, 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 I beg to differ on that, on that point. No one, I think, in the international community uh, prevents the Lebanese government to have a different opinion on um, the situation in Syria, the Lebanese government has, uh, and I, I said that earlier, has agreed and uh, stands firmly behind non-refoulement and stands firmly with the idea of dignified, voluntary and safe return of Syrian refugees. This is also the basis of the work of the general security uh, when they register Syrian refugees. So I, uh, I think the foremost uh, uh, you know, institution and person to address with uh, your anger and dissatisfaction is the Lebanese government. It's not the international community. It's not you know, what I think or what uh, the European Union thinks about um, the situation in Syria not necessarily needs to uh, influence what the Lebanese government thinks. Yeah. Just so that we can get to other people. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the kind of person to blame others for our problems, but uh, I think that the international community and the EU and Germany, instead of helping them in their country, you said that uh, I believe that Germany is not going to normalize uh, today or tomorrow with the Syrian regime. But I'm sorry, but this is not the uh, Lebanese problem. Mm. I mean, if, if it's uh, if there's a political issue between you and uh, Germany, Germany, uh, Germany and uh, Assad, well, I repeat, you're not the only one. But uh, we have to differentiate to, to separate these two problems, in my opinion. And uh, I'm uh, I think uh, I can confirm that uh, the war in Syria is over. It's been uh, five years that uh, people I know are going to Syria uh, on a daily basis. I personally went to Syria. And there are uh, safe safe areas that uh, can uh, that we, we can put the Syrian refugees there. Like uh, most of them here don't live in uh, in palace and uh, hotels. They live in tents. We can put these tents in the safe zones there. And most of them do, are not threatened by the Syrian regime. Like I said, mm. uh, maybe just two sure. short points on yeah. on this. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, I disagree with you there, <laughs> really. And I think it's not just, uh, you know, there's a huge problem uh, in terms of housing, uh, land and property. Uh, Syrian, it's not just for a Syrian, the idea of, uh, okay, I'm not going into prison the next day, so I can go there, but I have no space. The house I had there, the land I had there, the property I had there is gone. It's now in the hands of the regime, or it's been, uh, you know, it's been given to Hezbollah or any other affiliates. So there is way more than just the the idea of I'm physically safe for a certain period of time because there is no war. This is one thing. The other thing is, um, no matter how I put this, we have, uh, you know, m most of what. Uh, Germany is giving uh, into Lebanon, goes into the 
Lebanon Crisis Response Plan, which is a uh, fund or which is a plan which uh, finances Syrian refugees and host communities. And in fact, in a large part of what it's financing, more than half of it goes to Lebanese uh, host communities or Lebanese vulnerable Lebanese. So um, this is a, uh, uh, a funding which, where most of the international community pays into, into the Lebanese crisis response plan. And, you know, hypothetically, if there are no Syrian refugees here anymore, I don't think there will be funding. It's not, it, it's not, this is not a, uh, despite the poverty there is, this is not a typical uh, country where uh, donor community would, uh, would do large projects or large funding. So there's not, the idea cannot be in your back that no Syrian refugees, no funding here or all funding in Syria, therefore all Syrian refugees go there, um, uh, then the rest of the funding will go, will stay in Lebanon. This is, this is not, this is not happening. Mark, I think you should become an ambassador one day. You answered such a sensitive question with so much measure and calm. So thank you for that difficult question and statement as well. Uh, actually, I have a second guest already reserved. Nadim Shahdi wanted to ask the second one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, first, I have a very technical comment. The thing about halloumi cheese is that, <laughs> I knew it, is, I knew is it. that you can grill it, but it never melts. <laughs> uh, my, my, <laughs> I don't, don't know what to do with that. <laughs> my question is, is, is a bit technical because of... Uh, Sorry, we can't... I think the microphone is... Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, there we much go. Better, yes. Much better. Yeah. Uh, my question is a bit technical. It's about the investigation and the case uh, with about Riyad Salemi in, in Europe. It's described in the press in many ways, in many different, under many different titles. Sometimes it's called the EU investigation, sometimes it's called a German investigation, sometimes it's called, uh, you know, dif different states or different, different. Uh, so, um, I, uh, can, we, can we clarify what's the official status of the investigation? What triggered it? And what's the process? Is it part of state policy, EU policy, or, or that, that's my, my question. Basically. Don't believe anyone who says this is all political. So even if he had his birthday two days ago. Um, you know, this is a investigation which has been done in several European countries, and some of those European countries work together in a joint investigation team. They exchange uh, their uh, results and even they investigate together. Um, so this is uh, mainly France, uh, Luxembourg and uh, Germany. Um, and this is, uh, just to clarify this point, um, because uh, these three countries are not uh, doing the job of Lebanese investigators or judges because uh, money laundering has always two legs this is where you start the dirty business and where you do something with the money with the dirty business so we are on the do something with the money uh, from the dirty business side and uh, this is what uh, the three uh, prosecutors and investigators are exploring at the moment um, uh, there's uh, a different uh, Lebanese uh, issue. There's a judge. Uh, there's also uh, other judges who, uh, uh, you know, uh, represent the state, state of Lebanon, to uh, retrieve the money. Um, but all of this is just for one issue. This is about uh, money laundering from uh, Fori. Uh, 
and uh, money that went to uh, accounts in Switzerland from their back and then again to Europe and so on and so on. So this is and and I I'm I'm not an expert uh, and I haven't seen all the details of the investigation, but I would say it's promising. Is that good enough for Monica Bergman? I also would like to come back to the European Parliament resolution. I mean, the resolution is also encouraging <laughs> local investigations or local, um, say, it, trials. So, I mean, as far as, as soon as a German citizen is killed outside Lebanon, there is a German, invest maybe not an investigator, mm. but something like an investigator. So could this role for, I mean, there's a German judge or a German investigator for the port explosion victims. What is he doing? Or could his mandate be ameliorated, more performant? What is happening? So there is a uh, German uh, prosecutor in the case of uh, the two German uh, victims of the port explosion. Um, he is uh, dependent on uh, results of the investigation that is happening here. Um, and I, I would hope that um, there would be a way to allow uh, foreign investigators and prosecutors to participate in the results of the investigation here even uh, even before the investigation here is uh, finalized because now we have uh, uh, almost three years uh, since the uh, port explosion and I, I have the feeling that um, not that a lot of people have uh, forgotten about it, but it's not. Uh, it's it's somewhere below the other crisis that came afterwards. And um, apart from the families, and apart from those who have lost someone, uh, and apart from those who are angered by the fact that, uh, you know, this is easily forgotten. Uh, I fear that over time there, uh, there's, uh, there's less chance for accountability. And I, I personally, I, I find it uh, disgusting uh, that, uh, you know, Tarek Bita is prevented from working what he could do, what he can do. And um, I mean, he's the judge, and he has—he's uh, <laughs> been accused at the same same time, and uh, it's just unbearable, I think. Um, so I I would hope that there's a way that uh, international investigators and prosecutors from other countries where there are victims um, will be allowed to use the results he has come up with. Uh, even if he is not able to, even if he is prevented to finalize his his investigation. Are there any other questions? I saw one hand earlier. No, was that you, Adele? No. Oh no, sorry. Wow. Invent a question. No, someone in the back, I think, had a question. Right? Is that no? No. Wow. Oh come oh, on, Samir, go ahead, please. So my question is a little bit general. <clears throat> Um, considering the Declaration of Human Rights and the right for mobility, which is fundamental right, right? So how does that translate into countries having borders and visa applications and permissions that can be denied to travel to these countries? Isn't that a contravention of a human right? No. <laughs> Why not? Uh, no, I mean, um, it's the sovereignty or oh, hang on, it's the uh, the right of a sovereign state, I mean a state that has his borders, its borders established, 
it's the right of the state to determine who can enter and who cannot enter. So, you know, even if, even if we have, uh, and it's not a matter of visa or not. I mean, even if you have a, you know, a European passport and you want to enter uh, Germany, if I don't want you to enter, uh, or maybe a European passport is a stupid idea. If you have an American passport and I don't want you to enter, I can stop. I, even if you don't need a visa, I have the right to say no. You, you, I don't, I don't like you, for of course legal reasons. Uh, you cannot uh, enter. And also, even if you have a visa, I can still, if I find out something about you know what you've done in the past, what I don't like about you, uh, I can. I can annul this uh, visa later. So it's not a problem of visa, really. But uh, in fact, um, the good news is that, uh, you know, we are very happy to have uh, as many visitors as possible. And I don't think it is a, it is a, not in this country, I think, uh, it's a, a de- you know, a negatively determining issue uh, to get a visa or not a visa. So, unless you are asking for another country where it is difficult, more difficult to come to. But for Lebanon, I don't think it's this is a big uh, this is a big problem really. Not to Germany. <laughs> uh, the gentleman in the back, who I think I recognize him, but I just, I can barely see. Yeah, yeah. Just introduce yourself, please, to the audience. Hello, uh, I'm Al uh, I have a question uh, come to my mind right now. After last week, the German embassy uh, donate uh, like many scanner for the Beirut airport, mm. and everyone knows Beirut airport is like uh, Alibaba caves for Hezbollah. So how, how, how is the relation with this kind of donation will work? And what, what it's built on what trust with the Beirut airport or what? What is the story behind this? Uh, I can tell you many stories about, about Beirut airport. It's one of my favorite uh, topics, really. But on the subject of the scanners, these are four scanners in the uh, overall framework of a Berlin-Beirut airport partnership. I mean, it's your own fault if uh, as Beirut airport you want to deal with Berlin airport, but never mind. Um, These four scanners uh, will, they are technically better uh, equipped than the scanners you have now at the airport and will allow for checking outgoing luggage within uh, a few seconds. So it allows basically to um, uh, to manage more luggage at the same time uh, for outgoing passengers at the normal airport. I think the private plane airport uh, is a different scanner. Uh, not, I think, not from us. But um, what, is, what is the private plane? The, sorry. Uh, they are already working. Yeah. So yeah, I've is, seen it working. What is the private plane airport? The, I don't know who the scanner, who is doing the scanning at. But the that's private the s- same airport, but just the different. Uh, yeah, but I think the luggage is not scanned oh. in the same scanners. I see. I see. Okay. So, um, um, so if the question was, uh, what's the business with the scanners? So we, I, I think the idea was to uh, facilitate and to accelerate uh, scanning and uh, controlling of outgoing luggage. Does this answer your? Yeah. No, you're shaking your head. Yeah. There's a. Yeah, and we know who's working in the airport, and we know yes. who is the labor of the of the airport, and, and uh, I don't know if yeah, maybe it's my imagination, mm. uh, but I don't know it will function and it will be controlled, because we know what's happening in that uh, Alibaba cave. So. 
What's the Alibaba case? Sorry, uh, I missed that. Oh, it's like long, long story. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, you can order scanners from Alibaba as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what can I say? I mean, I, I, the, the, the 10 minutes I was there, nothing bad happened. So, But I guess uh, uh, it's a matter of trust. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I don't see the, I don't see the, you mean maybe, oh, what you, oh, yeah, now I see. You think that some of the luggage is not being controlled? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, all right. I um, I think I, I I don't know. I I I can't guarantee for that. I guess uh, it would. Yeah, I don't know. We're trying to help, but uh, maybe. By the way, I appreciate how disciplined the embassy staff is tonight. No one wants to ask you any questions. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is behaving. <laughs> He's leaving. <laughs> Now's hey, your hey, chance. Hey, 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 don't encourage. He's right? out. <laughs> Samir. Oh, there's a question there, please. Just introduce yourself, please. Hello, Joseph Arjami. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I can uh, feel we are reaching towards the end of this talk, so mm, mm. I'm, or not. No. <laughs> I'm, uh, no. So I have less of a technical question. Maybe I'm going to ask for your opinion. So um, the Lebanese people are frustrated um, that they can do too little to uh, help their country progress or go into the right direction. And um, my question is in concern of uh, which model do we want since we are now to the floor. Maybe it's time to, th to rethink how we, we want to build the state. Do we want to stay a centralized state or do we want to be something else? Do you think on a personal opinion that um, a model where federal states would be included in this country would bring this country forward and would bring the tensions down between the different sects that includes it. Thank you. Good this luck. sounds like a last question, but... Uh, <laughs> no, no, we'll have more <laughs> questions after. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have, a, I have an uh, uh, opinion on federalism, um, but... Uh, I, as I said earlier, I think um, very difficult to compare, you know, to compare systems and uh, federalism in one state or the other. But I think there's one uh, fundamental issue with uh, federalism that is, if you want functioning federalism, you need a very solid central state first central institutions otherwise i don't have an idea how that could work if you don't have uh stable solid uh central institutions and that's something uh sorry to say i don't see here not white not widely i mean there are maybe a few left but i don't see it um so uh as i don't want to give uh, advice on this uh, but I don't, I don't see that it's a good idea, really. Uh, not for, not for a start. No. But what does Nadim think about it? <laughs> well, I, I'll save Nadim. Uh, <laughs> anyone who wants a long four-hour response to Joseph's <laughs> question, check out the episode released over the weekend. Uh, it's three actually three six eight. Sorry? Yeah, you know the number. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. I shouldn't have been so hard on you. You know the number. <laughs> well, everything is local. You're right. <laughs> 369. <laughs> Grilled halloumi. <laughs> Doesn't melt. No, check out that episode if you can. It's a four-hour back and forth on exactly what you asked. Just let him, yeah, he wants to reply. Oh, Nadim wants to reply. Go. I, I just want to make a comment on that episode that uh, you and Hisham made most of the talking, I made most of the drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually true. <laughs> but the more you drink, Nadim, the better you sound. <laughs> Joseph, quickly, yeah. Very quickly. 
I watch most of your episodes, Roni. So oh, okay. of course I watch this one too. <laughs> I was only hoping for a personal opinion of uh, Mr. Ambassador about this topic, since myself also is, I'm residing in the federal state of Germany, and I was interested to know um, how this model could be not replicated but inspired of. Um, maybe in an effort to lower tensions between existential questions that bother the Lebanese so much regarding uh, which sect is going to win over the other. Um, so I know the positions of the federal parties in Lebanon. I don't know the one of, of your excellency. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. Are there more questions? I know that there are more questions. People were asking me to ask questions. Where did they go? There's no one. Yeah, over here, yeah. Were they staff <laughs> members? One in, somebody in the bathroom approached me for a question. I don't know where that person is. Uh, let me ask you then a quick question, and then if there's no others, we can wrap it up. Uh, I can imagine the harder parts of your tenure here, and I know arriving days before the port blast and then dealing with the aftermath, I'm going to just assume that that's the low point of your moment in this country. It starts off as the hardest challenge you're facing. But let's take it on the other side. What are the highlights of your stay here? It could even be anecdotal experiences, but just what you're, the positive angle that you're taking away. Waiting three years to sit in this chair. There you go. That's the answer. Round of applause Hello to Andreas. Me. That's pretty good. <laughs> Look at Halloumi. <laughs> Stop calling me Halloumi. <laughs> no, no, no. No, <laughs> no uh, okay, a highlight. Uh, you can call me Halloumi anytime. <laughs> <laughs> a highlight is, uh, you know, we, uh, my wife and I, we, uh, we climbed uh, Kornet Sauda and Mount Hermon, which is hmm. nice. Some two of the highest... That was good. And then I basically, I mean, every, every day you have, uh, uh, you know, I've been, I've been asked, why, why are you so bitter about this country and why do you hate us and so on? It's not true, really, it's not true. And uh, I have these, uh, I have these uh, encounters every day where the, you know, where I'm overwhelmed by the generosity and the openness of, uh, of Lebanese. Because uh, I come from a country where you walk along the street and you don't look at anyone. You just look at your... Uh, so, but here, you, you walk along the street and everyone smiles at you. Uh, and uh, any person you ask is willing to give you something or to invite you. And it's not... Uh, uh, it's really, a, I think, a, 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 daily, a daily experience that uh, that I feel always most welcome hmm. and uh, I think this is one this is really one of the one of the things I'll be missing when I when I leave because uh, this is this uh, you know people Lebanese want to hear from you that Lebanon is beautiful and uh, I I have difficulty saying this now but objectively uh there is a there is i'm i'm prevented from saying that lebanon is beautiful objectively because you have uh you know 80% of your wastewater goes just right into the mediterranean sea you have this stade waste management chaos and you have corruption all over the place so it's not really uh, but I, I fully understand that uh, Lebanese say that Lebanon is uh, beautiful. And I find the beauty in the openness and generosity of the Lebanese uh, people. So this is really, uh, uh, this, uh, this experience is a, is a highlight for me. I think that's wonderfully said. Hmm. I'll just ask if anyone else has a last question. No. Oh, okay. Why not? Just getting. You were generous with your time. I know we overstayed. It's a bit past. Well, it's nine forty. Mm. Um, 
I think those words you last shared. Chance. Last, last chance. Last chance. He wants another question. Yeah, no, there Give was him a question, question here. I, re I remember. <laughs> Sena, do you have a question? No? Over there, quiet people in the corner. There's even a PhD student, Eme Renem, right in the middle, who should be in Germany. She's here for this episode. No? No? <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay, Yala. The ambassador wants another question. It's this, Charles, from Montreal. Oh. <laughs> Do you have one? No? You have one, please. Yala. Yes. Let, yes. The last question. Hi, I'm Charlie. Uh, she wanted to know why you were leaving a year earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> I can explain. <laughs> uh, I said earlier, we, the first two years we moved around from hotel to hotel to monastery to interim apartment. And then finally, uh, on the 1st of August, a year ago, we moved into a beautiful residence in Babda with a nice garden. So when we were there, everything seemed to, you know, fall off our shoulders. And I asked Berlin to prolong not just until 24 but 25 I wanted to prolong because I liked it and I had the feeling that I deserve three years in this nice uh, uh, residence um, but then uh, a posting came up which I really wanted since I'm 13 years old uh, it's uh, Athens I become ambassador in Athens and it, this is the time I can uh, take it or I will never get it uh, again uh, so I've I've studied ancient Greek at university uh, and I I've learned modern Greek all my life so I really uh, could not uh, refuse this uh, posting that's why I'm leaving uh, a year earlier I'll say two things. Uh, I've met many ambassadors. And actually, at some point, I was in touch with the previous German ambassador to Lebanon. Many ambassadors, including himself, said no to coming on the podcast for whatever reason. I'm sure there's endless justification. Some prefer to wait until they've left to then talk <laughs> <Some> badly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So there's, a, there's already one scheduled for September. The, well, I, the EU ambassador will be leaving as well. We've booked, I think, September 1st. It's his first day after officially leaving. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> I think he's ready to say something. Yeah. Many have said no. Uh, you said yes. And I'm really honored that you spent some of your final journey in this country with me. You said it's been your dream for three years. <laughs> Honestly, since I met you, I've wanted you on the podcast as well. Why didn't you say anything? <sighs> you remind me of many women that I've dated. That <laughs> <laughs> Is this going places after? <laughs> I can make many jokes now. I'm not going to. Yeah, hmm. I'll show you my halloumi if you show yes. me. Your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's my broad worst. No, no. Okay. No, no, no. That's enough of that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, both can be grilled according to Nadim yeah. Shem. <laughs> but not melting. No, no, no. Yes. They don't melt. Okay, going back. <laughs> back, back. So they say no. You said yes. You were eager. We chose the date without any hiccups. And now I've spent a lot of time <laughs> grilling you, <laughs> but learning as well. And I appreciate you walking me through the basics of your day-to-day -day job and walking me through the extremely complicated terrain. And I think you handle both immensely well. The second thing I'll say, and let me be a bit cheesy, but I brought him up already. It's that opening line from Unbearable Lightness of Being. Ein Mal ist kein Mal. Mm. Once is nothing. You should come back. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much, Ronnie. It's a pleasure, and thanks to the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.